Let's start with Penn State. Penn Can we State. Do that? I Would that be got, so bad to do? I got my Roar Lions Roar shirt on, man. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready for this Penn State season. Uh, the over-under is 10 and a half. They were 10 and 3 a year ago. Very, very good team for sure. The frustration, of course, with Penn State was more of the same, right? A great against everybody on the schedule except for the best teams on the schedule. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling 10 and 2. That's the, I think, siren call for all things Penn State. It's at least yeah. been that way for the last couple of years. I view 2024 as perhaps the most pivotal year since James Franklin has got to Penn State. Wow. It is. Okay. It is. And it's for many of the reasons that I have described all throughout this offseason that I can go into detail about now. But uh, Penn State benefits perhaps above all else by the new system with the expanded playoff. They benefit Agreed. perhaps more than anybody else with the new divisionless structure of the Big Ten. The schedule for Penn State is spaced out pretty nicely. It gives them padding in between the headlining games, and this is a team that's got a lot back. Penn State should be a playoff team this year, full stop. Okay. Full stop. In my opinion, if they are not in the playoffs, this is a huge disappointment. Huge missed opportunity, and I don't know what happens next. Got to make the playoff this year. So the conversation in 2024 begins there and continues with James Franklin's two new coordinators. One, Andy kotel Nicky, who was hired away from Kansas, was kind of the higher of the cycle on the offensive side. And Tom Allen got fired from Indiana, but still a damn good coach in his own right, especially as it relates to defense. He is coming in. He's going to take over for Manny Diaz, who went to take over the Duke job. Both of them, in my view, excellent hires. I love it. I'm ecstatic to get both in the same cycle. Each guy, though, is in a little bit of a different situation. Sounds a little counterintuitive. I Granted, I feel like Tom Allen's got more pressure on him. Because Probably. the defense needs to stay at an elite level if they're going to make any kind of serious run at this thing. And they lost some difference makers to the NFL. Let's be clear about that. Tom Allen needs to step in, needs to hit the ground running in this defense. Maybe can drop off a little bit, but can't drop off too much. Is your guy DDS still there? DDS. I'm about to talk about that. Okay, defense, so sorry. About to talk. Don't get don't get ahead of yourself. Premature DDSing. Yeah. Notably on defense for this Penn State team, Tom Allen is making a little tweak. Little tweak. Okay. Playing more of a 4-2-5 this year. Functionally, what does that mean? That's his D, yeah. Functionally, it means that they're swapping a linebacker for a safety. Hybrid safety. Or a line, hybrid, yeah, yeah, The yeah. lion position, whatever they call it. Everyone's got a name for it now, mm -hmm. right? I think it's a smart move, especially since they're moving Abdul Carter from linebacker to edge rusher. That creates a really good situation, I think, along that defensive line. I am very excited about the combo of Abdul Carter and Deny Dennis Sutton. I was so confident in Deny Dennis Sutton a year ago that I botched his name. Well, that'll happen. It is sure. not Danny Dennis Sutton. It's spelled D-A-N-I. He says it deny. Yeah. Deny, deny you the opportunity. We are denying yeah. all of these other Big Ten teams the opportunity to get a leg up on this defense. Okay. Uh, beyond that, their top four defensive tackles are back. They're very deep up front. The danger on this defense starts in the trenches. Their line should be ferocious. If they're in danger at all on the defensive side, it's probably at corner where they had a lot of turnover because Kalen King and Johnny Dixon and Daquan Hardy all went pro. This year they bring in A.J. Harris from Georgia, Jalen Timber yeah. from Florida to help plug some of those gaps. I could see it taking a little bit for those guys to mesh, but they're backed up by a really good set of safeties. And the good news is that there aren't a whole lot of high-flying offenses, at least not in the early part of the season on the schedule. They've got okay. like, I don't know, a month and a half to before they play a team like a USC, which... As we know in we, LA, yeah, in LA, U USC is built more to take advantage of that. But um, as long as Tom Allen isn't doing the full college football 25 simulation of the defense, <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a beast of a unit and they're going to be real, real good. That goes without saying, yeah, the key to this entire thing is offense. And it wasn't bad last year, I don't mean to imply it was a 
bad offense, but it was very underwhelming. Let's be clear. So what Andy Kotel Nicky can do with this offense is going to decide how the whole thing goes. He's a super creative mind. His work at Kansas should be in the freaking Louvre. All right. <laughs> Kansas, yeah. Kansas was nowhere before Lance Leipold got there. And through Leipold, Andy Kotel Nicky, they turned into a really good offense, especially a really strong running team which is what I like about this hire. I would love to see Penn State build the whole damn plane out of Nick Singleton and Catron Allen, who are their two star running backs, and just go from there. Figure it out from there, but start with the running game, build it around those two dudes, and then we can work in more receivers, more passing schemes for Drew Aller, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, I think that's the teeth of the offense. Okay. Hopefully he feels similarly. Last season, that is not to say they didn't try, because they did. But they lost pretty much all of their home run threats. This offense had virtually no explosion in 2023. So the caveat is you got to try and get some of that pop back. The caveat is that the line is relatively green. They lost three starters to the NFL. So yeah. good good line a year ago. Probably still fine with a lot of talent. They've recruited well. But possible danger if they take too big a step back and if they rely a little bit or, or try to rely a little bit too much on that running game. That brings me to Drew Aller in the passing game. This is where it really hurt them that there wasn't a home run threat. Actually, let me let me, let me back up. This okay. is where it really hurt them when they had receivers, an entire room of receivers that couldn't get open. They got yeah. no separation all year long. Only so much you can do. And that's not to say some of it wasn't on Drew Aller. He's still relatively green. I've talked ad nauseum on this show about how he picked up the quarterback position Later, he hasn't been playing it since he was 10 years old. He's still learning to play okay. this position. Some of it's on him. Most of it's on the receivers not getting open. So what happened in the offseason? They all left. <laughs> they all left. All the receivers are gone. Yeah, they all left. This is a bad receiver room a year ago. It's basically a brand new receiver room this year because something like five guys transferred out. Um, the top target appears to be Julian Fleming, who transfers in from Ohio State. Otherwise, it's Harrison Wallace and Caden Saunders, who were very lightly used a year ago. Tyler Warren is back at tight end. I, I like him a lot. Okay. Whether it's these guys, whether it's somebody else lower on the depth chart, it is essential that somebody else step up. Somebody else needs to step up and become a reliable target. There needs to be more of a supporting cast around Allard. Maybe it's Nick Singleton or Katron Allen in the passing game. I don't know. Maybe it's Tyler Warren. Here is where we are relying on that creativity from Andy Kotel Nicky to unlock this passing game because last year under Mike Yurisich in a system that felt more rigid for whatever reason, it did not click. It needs to click. Let me say one more thing about Drew Aller. PFF, I mentioned this too, PFF posted something on their site about how Drew Aller is one of the most disrespected quarterbacks in looking back in 2023. He had a 25 to two touchdown to interception ratio. Objectively, that's very good to my eye. He never fully looked comfortable. Right. I don't know if that's a processing thing. I don't know if it is truly fair to throw the receivers under the bus the way I just did, but I think it bears mentioning that another year in this system, hopefully with a better offensive coordinator gives Drew Aller the seasoning that he needs to maybe get to that five-star potential. He was good last year. He wasn't great. He wasn't a five-star last year. Right. A more flexible system, I am hopeful, can get him there. Three yards per attempt against Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. He was good against everybody, just not the best teams on the schedule. Yeah, he was more... He was... Uh... I, I would appreciate how safe he was. Not safe, but like clean. Responsible. Two interceptions, right? He was responsible. But here's the thing, Dan. Yeah. If you come in, and, and maybe this is the part that wasn't fair to Aller. Okay. When you come in as a five-star, people look to you to win games. Yeah. They look to you in a game like that Michigan affair or Ohio State or any of the bigger teams on the schedule. Even At Ole home, Miss. no head coach against Michigan. For sure. But if the running game isn't working and isn't giving you the pop, that's when people look at the five-star quarterback and they say, go win the game for us. Yeah. And he was not able to do that, either because he was not ready or did not have the skills or did not have the receivers, but the passing game was not good enough for that. 
So they got to fix that. They got to get better. They don't need to necessarily be the Mike Leach air raid this season, but they have to offer a second pitch. Yeah. This is a great schedule. Like, oh, yeah. This is a great, it feels like this should be a playoff team with this. It's well balanced. There's enough firepower on here to be taken seriously, but yet good buffers after all the big games. There's a five week stretch between the middle of October and early November that I think decides this season. At USC, then a bye, then at Wisconsin, home against Ohio State, home against Washington. Yes. That's the stretch right there. West Virginia to open up the year is tricky, and it's on the road. And a weird early kick too, right? It's weird, uh, the yeah. noon. Yeah, yeah. I'm not as concerned because I think Penn State should be good enough at stopping the run, and certainly, as I said, on the defensive line, that – stopping West Virginia's run should be something that they can handle. But West Virginia is a good ball club. We'll, we'll know like pretty early on what this defense looks like against a good power rushing team. But I agree. Um, I'm not, I'm not out here saying I'm going to throw all my money on over 10 and a half. I'm just saying as somebody wearing a Penn state shirt and somewhere around here has a diploma hanging on the wall that if they're not making the playoffs this year, it is supremely disappointing. And I don't know what that means for James Franklin's future. Yeah. Like, and I feel weird saying that because he's had a lot of success there and I have nothing against him, truly. But this this is the year. This is the year to make that playoff. And um getting a home game at Beaver Stadium is on the table. That would be awesome. They've winterized yeah. the stadium now. They've talked a lot about that. They're in the throes of this major renovation to the football stadium. This is the year to kind of lay it all out in the line and uh, get the most out of what I think is a really exciting class that came in, you know, back in 2022. They have one team on their schedule in Ohio State, which is at home in Happy Valley, that looks to be a surefire top 10, 12, 15 team. One team. Now, somebody might surprise, obviously, USC or Wisconsin or Washington. Somebody's going to pop up and offer more of an obvious threat than where it sounds seems to be right now. But as it stands now, maybe it's West Virginia, who knows? As it stands now, in terms of talent, in terms of situation, in terms of pop, it's only the Buckeyes right now. No. Can't lose it's to Michigan it. if you don't play Michigan, right? Dan, it's there for them. Yeah. There's a reason why their 10 and a half is tied with Oregon and Ohio State as the best in the conference. It's because the schedule works. The team is good. The coordinators that they went out and got are good. There's a ton of talent across the board. This should be a year that Penn State gets in the playoffs. So um, I don't know how many teams ultimately get in from the Big Ten, but my hunch is at this point, if we're assuming three, seems reasonable, Penn State would be the third. Would you rather be Penn St like a Penn State fan this year or a Michigan fan this year? I would rather be a Michigan fan because my team would have just won the national title. That's true. And expectations are always high at a program like Michigan. Yeah. But there is a little bit of a grace period. You can exhale given, a little bit. Yeah. You can exhale a little bit. And there's a grace period whenever you lose that much. The coach, all the players, et cetera. You can take that step back and you still want the team to play well. You never want to lose to Ohio State. But you've already gotten to the top of the mountain. Penn State, I'm fearful that it's going to feel like we get into week 12 and again we're banging our head against the wall wondering what could have been yeah that's all reasonable yeah i i would probably feel better about penn state's year as a penn state fan than i would feel like for isolating in a vacuum as a michigan fan than michigan's year because similarly built but we think there's more passing upside with penn state and aller even after not all on him a, a 2023 that really saw some struggles going downfield consistently which yeah Disappointing, I'm sure, for Penn State fans. But with this schedule, like you should be, as you are, brimming with confidence that the best of Penn State should be able to make the playoff this year. And, and look, this is not to say it's an easy schedule. It's the 34th toughest schedule right now per Bill Connolly's Right, but in terms of home road splits and missing, missing Oregon and Michigan, yeah. Home road splits are good. It's also not a USC schedule, which maybe we can talk about next, right? Like it's, it's, it's one of the easier schedules in this conference. And... Truly on display is this new setup and how it could benefit Penn State. Right. Got to take advantage of these opportunities. They don't come around all that often. They should, they should have been coming around more often. Yeah. They just haven't for Penn State. So this at, is this is the at year. your Minnesota Golden Gophers, though. 
Taiyu Ma. I am a little bit fearful of that game. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. All the Minnesota stuff. I'm not just paying lip service. I understand. I hear I you. I am serious about Minnesota this year. Arguably, Minnesota's biggest modern win was over Penn State. It's true. In Minneapolis a few years ago. I gotta yeah. get I gotta get one of those cool Minnesota shirts and wear it. Okay. To support Goldie? the team this yeah. year. Yeah. Fair enough.